How are you? Good, good. How are you? Very good. So nice to see you after so long. Yes, really nice. Thanks for being my. Yeah, no, it's good to have you uh, on board and chat with you. So we thought it'll be super amazing to have you uh, part of the series because you come from like a best combination of the design world and the su uh, sustainability world. So I think it'll be super interesting to chat with you. I'm sure it will be. Looking forward to <laughs> yes. connect with you also again. Yeah. So um, great. So I think we have some participants. I think we can start. Uh, maybe participants can keep joining in. Uh, so just for all the people who have joined in for to listen to the conversation, it would be great if you put all of you, uh, your mic on mute. Uh, and if you have any questions while we are having the conversation, just keep typing it into the chat window. Uh, and by the end of the session, we'll take the questions from the audience as well. Uh, so just to introduce myself, I am Nikita Gugri. I am the uh, founder of Zeno Collab. Uh, we are a service design company based in Pune, India. Uh, and this is part of the one of the conversation of this video series that we have started, uh, which is called as Service Design Halftime, where we are connecting with different uh, practitioners of service design and the design fraternity to understand how has been their journey like, what kind of a new challenges do they foresee, because all of us are going through a, a very different times right now. Uh, just to hear out what they say uh, is the goal of the conversation. So today we are on our fourth chat, a conversation with Sarah Anderson. Uh, she is an innovation consultant and she also has her own uh, initiative uh, and the company called This Is Future. Uh, so uh, This Future, sorry for the error. Nice. So uh, who that works, <laughs> so that works um, in the domain of sus uh, promoting sustainability goals and how can we achieve those uh, in different companies. So I'm sure she can talk more better about it. Uh, so in the beginning, thanks a lot, Sarah, for joining in. Um, we are looking forward for the conversation for really long. Uh, so in the beginning, can you tell a bit about yourself that how has been your journey like? Uh, how did you land up becoming a designer and how did your path change from the conventional design into the sustainability and circular design? Uh, so it will be great if you can begin with that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I actually come from a background within industrial design, which I started to study just because um, I thought that was a great way to uh, to help people, to make things better for people, to solve uh, to solve problems. Um, and so yeah, so in the beginning of my design journey, I very much focused on designing physical objects. Uh, and then slowly my perspective shifted and, uh, and I started working much more uh, in a service design, with a service design approach, uh, taking like a bigger picture uh, of, of needs into account and focusing more on, on the experience, not just uh, the interaction with the product or service, but the experiences around, which gave me the opportunity I felt to, uh, yeah, to create a bigger, bigger change. Um, so I worked in design consultancies for most of my career, uh, big and small, and also, as you mentioned, in my own company, this future. Uh, and I kind of, always had the interest in sustainability and it was also actually kind of a friction for me because I did spend a lot of time working on physical products while I also observed the world around me and felt okay maybe maybe we should just have a little bit less of these physical products because we're wasting much too much uh, or using up much too much uh, materials uh, with, with big negative impacts on the world around us. Um, and then at some point I, I, uh, I learned about circular economy and then I thought, okay, this is actually how it can be done. So we can actually design products still, but we just have to do it uh, with a much more systemic approach. Uh, and considering how we can design products in a, in a circular way. 
yeah, so that was kind of the journey before, uh, and I've worked a lot with the with circularity uh, and designing circular solutions. But I'm also very much interested in in how like the systemic approach of of how we can get everybody on board in this shift. So not just businesses, but also all of us as individuals. Uh, uh, and also governmental organizations, how can, how can they support this shift that we need to make as a society? So that's why I've taken on this position now as innovation consultant in the Center for Innovation in Aarhus, which is an in-house innovation team um, that helps uh, designing new ways to, to welfare. That's our vision. Uh, and we do that in collaboration with both citizens uh, and, uh, and employees across the municipalities and also external partners um, in order to kind of uh, yeah really look at, at these problems on a, on a systemic um, uh, scale and one of our most important uh, focus areas these days is to support the climate vision of the city of Aarhus which is to be CO2 neutral in 2030 so there we're trying to find projects and initiatives that will really matter where we can activate both citizens and NGOs and, and uh, companies to uh, to accelerate this change. Yeah, I think it's great to hear the journey like because that is like the journey I think a lot of designers should take and have started taking and started shifting that focus from uh, a very tactical product design to more systemic and holistic approach to any problem uh, statement or any pro solving any problem. Uh, uh, and it's it's amazing, like and, and super good that you pointed out that this is not only what industries and companies needs to take up, but we as individuals, governments also need to start uh, working and changing our approach towards circularity. Uh, so here I have a question where conventionally we used we used to be a certain kind of a designer, then we became service designers who were uh, still looking at more of a broader picture, looking at the ecosystem. So according to you where does the new version of service design should lie uh, and also how it can be mixed with say circularity or the humanity centered design that you advocate a lot about. So what do you see is the new face of the service design, the new field of design or the new approach that needs to come up? Yeah, so I think it's it's definitely what you, what you say. Uh, so what I've talked about um, a lot and, and thought about a lot is how we need to move from the human-centered perspective that we've had for a long time and which has of course produced a, a, a good amount of products and services but our mind has still very much been that of focusing on solving uh, certain challenges of a selected user group at this point in time. So by that we've kind of excluded a bigger group of people who are actually influenced by solutions. Uh, we've excluded ecosystems in most cases and also maybe some societal um, that our solutions are having. Uh, and, and also like the effect on future generations. Um, so, so what I think we need to do is to move uh, towards a humanity-centered uh, design approach where we take exactly these, these factors into account, where we try to look at uh, the solutions we designed on a more systemic level, look at the bigger system that they're part of, and also where we, where we dare to look at uh, the unintended consequences that our solutions might be having, which I feel that we we're not that great at doing maybe as designers because we're so used to thinking in the positive effects that we want to create um, that maybe we much too little focus on, on potential unintended consequences and of course foresee them all um, but I think we need to uh, implement a practice where we where we just release solutions into the world but where we keep monitoring them for, for unintended consequences and are able to return to them and tweak them in if we see that they're going in the wrong di direction. Yeah. So I think this unintended consequences becomes very very interesting perspective to look at things and be mindful of uh, so it'll be really great if you can uh, elaborate a little bit on that and if you have any example that you can think of so that everyone on the call also can understand what do we actually mean by unintended consequences and how that can how can we leverage that to actually come up with a solution which is more holistic and more mindful yeah so 
I often take the, the example of a healthy snack as an, as an example, um, because you can imagine how a healthy snack on the go, like something prepackaged, but that really actually contains some nutrients, not just, uh, not just uh, sugar, um, but, but a nutritious snack that you can handily take on the go uh, so that you can actually keep your energy levels up and you avoid all kinds of uh, health issues for people from people choosing something not so healthy. But then because it's made to be efficient, because it's made to be taken on the go, you're certainly dealing with some sort of uh, packaging um, where that's not really a plan for. So that packaging in the end then uh, uh, risks very much ending up in nature. I think it's 32% of all uh, plastic disposal, uh, where it of course disrupts uh, ecosystems both on land and in the ocean as, as we're very painfully familiar with at this point in time, the big problem of ocean plastics that disrupts also the marine ecosystems and, and actually kills animals and and then in the in the long run it actually again ends up uh, on our dinner plates because we consume the fish that has been consuming the microplastics um, yeah so we solve an individual problem in a way we solve a problem for one user about being more healthy while you have a busy life uh, but we create much bigger problems uh, in on a systemic level by focusing only on the individual needs. Yeah, yeah I think uh, that also brings me to my next question is, uh, hello? Yeah, so I think it brings me to my next question is, uh, during this uh, Corona and COVID-19 times, we are also seeing a lot of unintended uh, changes that are affecting uh, the environment in different ways. The way, um, the way we are right now under lockdown, everyone is sitting at home and it has some different kinds of effects on the uh, environment. So how do you see this consequences or unintended effects on the environment? How can, how, what can we learn from that point one? Uh, and are there any different changes that we need to do in our uh, lifestyle? Yeah, that's a very good question and a very big one. <laughs> I think we, we actually also see the positive consequences, of course, from people not moving around so much. So, so the air quality has, has increased dramatically in, in very many areas of the world. Um, but of course, it's not really helpful in the long run because as soon as country by country opens up again, if, if unless certain measures or policies are adopted um, or new habits are adopted, uh, it will not change anything in the long run. Um, so I think, I think the most crucial thing is to kind of try to use this situation as an opportunity to kind of stop and reflect and see uh, how we can use some of these uh, consequences that have arisen uh, unintentionally, uh, how we can use the positive consequences that has come out of this uh, and, uh, and uh, keep, keep them uh, and develop them towards uh, a desirable future. But it requires some work. It requires that we really stop now and, and reflect and, and be very conscious about the next steps that we take. Yeah. Uh, so as a design community, do you think uh, there needs to be any change in mindset or change in behavior? Uh, as a designer, we need to learn, how can we learn from this uh, period of lockdown and post COVID? Also, how can we be more mindful as an individual who is working differently as a designer or if you are working in a big company, either way? Well, I think there are definitely a lot of learnings, at least in our team. Um, we've been forced to learning a lot about online collaboration. Uh, so it's not really what, what any of us wished for, I think, because as designers, we're so used to uh, working with tangible materials, working together, being in front of a big board with a lot of post-its and, and generating ideas. We're also used to being out in the field and like physically being with the people that we need to learn from, if it's a, if it's a janitor or a nurse uh, or a librarian, we're used to, this is kind of the foundation for, for our work to kind of observe people and really understand uh, 
their challenges and their everyday lives. Um, so that is definitely challenging. And, and I think we can never do exactly the same as, as uh, digitally as we can do out in the field. But I think we've also been quite surprised in my team at how much we actually can do. So we conducted a lot of online interviews. We, uh, we've used uh, mobile probes um, to gather insights. Uh, and we also um, we also had online events uh, like this, and we used breakout yeah. sessions in online events to do workshops. Um, so so it's still possible to do a lot, and also on the collaboration side, we've yeah learned to use these digital boards and and post its. And though not everything is working ex exactly as we're used to some things are actually better so we just reflected on actually that it was a nice thing with this virtual boards with the with posters is that you can actually see what everybody writes yeah. in real time so you can kind of respond very quickly to what to what uh, somebody else writes on the post-it um yeah, so that's one thing. And what I was also thinking, what I've been thinking a lot about is, is how much travel we can actually avoid when we work like this. So it's actually possible to do a lot without traveling and, and with a, a accompanying uh, climate uh, effect that that is having. Uh, and you can also think now I've been working uh, like you have on, on a very global scale in some of my earlier jobs and going to Hong Kong over for, for 24 hours to run a workshop wasn't, uh, wasn't a strange thing. And now I'm thinking, why? Uh, and I think that's something we've all learned that these things are actually very possible to do online. And it's really uh, madness to travel for, for that short uh, uh, work sessions to the other part of the world. So I think, and, and, and at the same time, that's actually an opportunity, uh, I think, for us designers to work on a more global scale. So if, if there's a Danish company uh, working on a new medical solution and it's aimed at India, for example, then it's uh, so much more easy and, and climate friendly at this point in time where we are now with the, with the experiences we've all gained uh, in, in digital collaboration to, yeah. to hire one of you uh, who is, uh, who is uh, in place in India to, to help them with their insights. So I think that's yeah. definitely a, a huge perspective also uh, for the future. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's so interesting times right now is that irrespective of which industry you are working in, uh, which domain you're working, what level you're working in, I think everyone is trying to figure out what works the best, which tool works yeah. the best. And uh, there is a collaboration. We might even see like the level of collaboration increasing than what it used to be before. Uh, I think so. So it's yeah. definitely, yeah. It's very, very uh, interesting time that everyone globally is trying to figure out and uh, like trying to find that the best tool that works for them. Yeah, um, it's actually so a big prototype that we're that we're doing <laughs> at this point, testing yeah. and, and prototyping and fine tuning. Uh, yeah, very much uh, yeah. a sort of design approach to learning yeah. and, and improving. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's a very beautiful way to put it that we are in the pilot mode right now to <laughs> figure out work, what works and what does not work. Yeah, uh, yeah I think it's, I really like the, the way you put it. Uh, uh, so I wanted to ask that because now after COVID, we, everyone as industries, as consumers, everyone is going to come out as a different personality altogether. Uh, so do you see uh, the focus points of, for organizations, for companies? think that is going to change and how do you think the importance on circularity and circular design or service design um, or humanity centered design however you want to put it is going to uh, increase is focus going to come back on that more than ever before uh, if yes then how do you think that happening uh, and why do you think uh, it will be more important moving forward well let's choose to be a uh, uh optimistic so so yes i'm 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 uh, i'm very much uh, hoping and thinking that this will be an opportunity for for also for businesses to reflect on on their next steps and also to to kind of stay uh, to be prepared for for an uncertain future i think this pandemic has kind of been one indication of of 
the kind of uncertainties that we're looking into uh, when we think about the future. And then, of course, we've also seen all of these uh, supply chains being disrupted yeah. through the pandemic, uh, which, which I hope will have the positive effect that companies reflect more on um, on, on, on their strategies as how to their supply chains are put together and also um, yeah, the opportunity to, uh, to uh, kind of have a strategic advantage at keeping, uh, through keeping their materials in, in circulation. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, that's, that should be an opportunity that companies are looking into because we see, and it's, it's like, it's not new uh, right now either with the materials we've seen prices in materials uh, increasing. They were dropping throughout the last century and then since the millennium shift, uh, material, raw material prices have only been increasing, plus there's much, there's much more volatility, so they change a lot more the prices, which makes it hard um, to plan ahead as a business. And once you implement circular uh, supply chains, uh, circular value chains, then actually you have much more control of, of your costs so i think that plus of course we're also looking into a demand on the on the consumer side uh, and business to business side of much more both individuals and and collaboration partners looking to to have collaborations and and buy from companies who are already committed in this area yeah um and um what do you think are the challenges um, we as individuals or as companies might face in adopting such a, a new approach or new mindset or change in mindset because a lot of prior internal priorities right from budgets to approaches to mindset a lot of thing needs to be uh, shifted or it has already been started shifting uh, so what kind of challenges do you see the industries or, or individuals might face in moving towards yes that? I think, I mean, I think there are several barriers that are like in place on a more, uh, on a higher systems level again. And I think one is that, uh, that we're not paying the real cost. Yeah. Um, and that comes both for individuals buying a, a t-shirt in a fast fashion um, chain, uh, then we're actually, if it only costs $10, it's, it does mean that somebody at the other end hasn't gotten paid properly and that the company hasn't paid for the pollution it has caused through, through that production or the enormous uh, um, uh, consumption of water that was went into the cotton production. Um, and also if we look at companies uh, and industries and, and pollution, it's not something that you pay for at this point in time. And there are a lot of discussions around the world at this point, also in Denmark around, so how can you actually implement a system um, where uh, you, there's an incentive uh, towards doing the right thing, an economic incentive. So it's, it's a lot of talk about CO2 taxes, uh, which which can be one way to, to make mm. the polluter pay. Yeah. Uh, and if you implement that, then you can also kind of harvest that money and redirect mm. it towards, uh, towards uh, positive development, towards mm. sustainable solutions. Mm. So I think that's, that's definitely one more systemic um, uh, barrier yeah. uh, at this point in time. But I think it will change. I think we will see changes soon there. Mm. And then, of course, it's a lot about uh, mindsets mm. and habits as well. Uh, I think on the consumer side, on the individual side, it's very much, I'm trying to dig deep into uh, climate psychology at this point in time. And what everybody seems to agree upon is that it's uh, super important also that we feel that we're part of a community when we're doing this. So it's all also about shifting the whole social norm, making the climate yeah. friendly, sustainable uh, behavior, the, the new normal. Uh, because yeah. we, we want to do what others that we identify with do. And it's actually the most, the most important driver towards transforming individuals' behavior. Hmm. Right, right. Uh, just a quick note uh, to the participants. If they have any questions, you can start typing down in the chat window and then we can start taking one by one. Uh, I think we already have one. It says that uh, what are the emerging markets you think exist due to the global lockdown? Um, Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, so we have one question from Bharat Singhal. Uh, the question is what are the emerging markets uh, you think exist due to 
the global lockdown. As new marches will emerge due to the global lockdown. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. I think, I mean, everything related to digitalization is of course uh, booming. Um, but I also think, and it's a very, it's a very interesting point in time also to observe, uh, observe signals around and, and try to speculate on the effect that they will be having. So I think in many ways we don't have the, have the answers yet. So I'm, I'm thinking a lot about how, how can we keep the positive effects of globalization while maybe actually pull supply chains closer so we can avoid some of the very polluting transportation? Uh, and how could that look? How could you still like have the economic exchange maybe or at least the positive benefits mm. of that? So, uh, but maybe it's in knowledge instead of in, in actual physical goods because knowledge uh, isn't, uh, isn't uh, damaging our climate when it's being mm. exchanged as, as products are. Yeah. So I'm hoping at least we will see uh, some sort of shift there towards exchanging yeah, intellectual mm. um, goods yeah. instead of physical goods. Yeah, yeah I think it'll be, uh, yeah, that also it's interesting point to say that it might not be only uh, exchange of like tactical exchange of goods that you're saying but because it's going to be like what you're saying is it could be like intellectual exchange then we might see exchange happening between disconnected industries as well because yes. it's not always about me supplying you a certain material for you to create one product but it is more of the the intellectual and the mindset conversation and the exchange that might happen I think that's a very important point as well, and I think uh, think and hope that that's something that we will see much, much more about uh, collaborations across industries, learning from each other, much more open innovation, much more partnerships and, and symbiosis um, arising, uh, and, and like seeing new possibilities. Like I think what countries around the world have experienced now is that it's actually possible to uh, to to do new things you have a you have a vodka producing industry but it's also possible to use it to produce uh, um, sterilizing um, how do you call it disinfection uh, uh, gel uh, yeah. so I think I think and that's what I hope also that we will see a much more agile mindset uh, towards right. um, making making change where it's where it's needed yeah. right. Great. Uh, we have another question from Lynn. Uh, the question is, could you tell us more about the circular value chain? Yes. Um, well, when we talk about circularity, it's, it's, uh, it's in, a, in essence, it's about doing more with less, right? Uh, so sometimes it's confused with, it's, with being only about recycling. So at the end of a product's life, we need to uh, take care of the materials and turn them into new products but actually that that should be the last resort so you could be looking into value change value chains instead where you ensure that you use products for as long as possible and as efficiently as possible so then you talk about uh, products or, or value um, value chains where you return products um, to back to the company, uh, maybe because you uh, you uh, rent it uh, a product as a service instead of buying the product, then there's again this incentive for companies to uh, to actually produce uh, high quality products that can live for a long time. You also have the um, the sharing. Uh, models, of course, uh, which seems to make a lot of sense for some products like cars that are only driving 94%. Uh, no, they're only driving four of the time and not six percent of the time. They're actually parked uh, or looking for parking. Um, so that means you can use those materials and that energy that went into the car much more efficient by sharing it with others. Uh, and then you have the models of repair and remanufacture. Uh, the products return again to the producer, uh, or you enable uh, a consumer to. Um, to um, 
And you can also, so that's the, the interaction chains and the interaction with the consumer. And then I, what I think is very interesting as well is, is when companies uh, look into connecting to each other's value chains, where you can be looking at how one company's uh, waste actually can be another company's resource. And I think there we're just starting to see some really great examples. And I think that's definitely an area that will be booming. Okay. Great. Um, so we have uh, one more question from Janvi. Uh, she's asking, uh, is the circular economy only relevant when it is it comes to climate or environmental or it is relevant regards to in regards to other sectors too? disconnect in human connections etc um yes that's a good question i think i think you we can definitely so one thing is the is the um, um security side like being uh being planning ahead for the future and and keeping track of your business i talked to about before so it can be an economic advantage to move to towards a circular uh, business model. It can definitely, what you touch upon here, the disconnecting human connection, If at least if you think in, um, in, uh, in sharing models, it can definitely also be a means to, uh, to, to feel that you're actually in a community um, acting together because you're sharing a, a resource like a car or, or you have a tool, uh, tool bank uh, because a drilling machine is again, of course, something you don't really use, need to own, right? Because you maybe you only use it uh, a couple of times a year. So I think you can definitely imagine how you build concepts and services around uh, mm. that are circular around the concept of connecting people as well. That's a very beautiful thought. Yeah, yeah I think it's really beautiful. It can also be connect if i have to connect back to the unintended consequences so we can intentionally design uh, the the effects of the circularity and the sharing resources and different systems so that uh, uh, the connecting like connecting the human getting back the human connection becomes like a byproduct of it. definitely yeah i think that's a really interesting thought too uh, we have already crossed our time limit. If anyone has any question, maybe we can quickly take it. Otherwise, we can uh, conclude the session. Yeah, good. Um, it was great chatting with you, Sarah, to even hear our different thoughts. I think uh, it was really nice. Like, I really liked a few points that you pointed, like how uh, designing systems in a way that we can get another thought I really liked I think it's I'm going to keep that with me is that how this lockdown period is like a it's like a pilot run for us to figure out how our new life needs to be so I think these are really really interesting pointers that it's like a definite like a big takeaways for me uh, so thanks a lot for spending time thank you uh, and chatting with us it's always great to speak with you the same it was really nice to connect again and thanks to to everybody for the for the good questions yes it will it's great i think uh, we hope to keep connecting again for some of the other events like how we connected last time uh, so we'll be in touch definitely sounds great yes thank you so much for everyone to join the call uh, thanks a lot have a great weekend all of you you too. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye.